Dave Hank, the city manager. Um, just real quick, I just want to give a little background. Um, so uh, on January 11th, the city council uh, annexed 97.83 acres of what was or is still a rail property. Um, there was uh, already 13.73 acres of the proposed development that were in the city limits. So there's a good map that sort of ends up with the number that we're at. City codes, um, specifically 112307, is very specific that all properties when they're annexed into the city must come in at RLD, which is residential low density. So this property upon annexation was formally zoned per city codes uh, residential uh, RLD. So with that, the applicant agrees home is requesting approval of special planning district, which we call SPDs. So your SPD are tonight, that's um, a lot of communities use PUDs, we're really unique to these special planning districts, but this process is basically the same. Um, this, uh, as defined within the city plan, is so Dries is requesting S SPG will allow for the development of 209 lots consisting of 74 patio style homes and 135, 135 traditional style homes. Uh, lot range size range is between a minimum of 6,760 to a maximum of 11,960 square feet with a maximum building height of 40 feet. Um, the developer is proposing access into the development both from Manville Road to the north and State Route 48 to the south with entry signs, uh, landscape energy size at each access point. The asset, the applicant has completed a traffic impact study by SHA and engineering, which he included that an eastbound turn lane would be required from State Route 48 slash open road into the development. So it's sort of a picture on the entry. Picture of turn uh, turn lane in there. Um, the developer is proposing that all existing ponds within the property are be preserved and maintained by the HOA. The developer is proposing that all open spaces, entry landscape, many areas, trails, and sidewalks be under maintained by the HOA. Uh, they listed an application to develop that indicates that approximately 83% of the homes within the development will apply to open space. Um, all public streets, storm water, and water meters will be. So the process of an SPD is a little detailed of, uh, we usually tell people when we first sit down and talk about an SPD, we sort of tell them the process will take about six months, um, or maybe a month and a half into the process. So, so the way the process works, you know, sort of like where we're at and what, what's next is the city, uh, our SPD process requires that all applications first to go to the planning and zoning commission to determine if the project falls within the SPD purpose and scope. So the theory there is before any SPD, whether it's a three or a smaller operation, before they even proceed down the road with an SPD, they provide enough adequate information for the planning and commission to say, yay or nay, it does or doesn't meet the requirements in SPD. I will note that is not a public hearing, that is simply, are you all to move forward? If they determine that they feel an zoning commission, excuse me if I say easy, but if they determine that the proposed project does fall within the SPD purpose and scope, then they set up a public hearing, which is that same night. So this action was completed by the Planning Zoning Commission on February 1st, 2022, at which time they determined that the proposed project met the requirements of an SPD, and at that time they set up a public hearing for March 1st, 2022. We made a little error in the notification to make it correct. We rescheduled the public hearing to March 17th because we are required to meet certain, we are required to meet certain uh, public notifications we missed one. So rather than forward ahead, we stopped, rescheduled, that's why you're all here tonight, rather than March 1st. That was on the city, uh, all due to transparency. Uh, so following the action of, by the planning zoning commission on February 1st, which they've done, so now we're sort of where we are moving forward. The next step in the SPD process is for the PNC Planning Zoning Commission to take formal action on the SPD initiation application and for the recommendation to the City Council. So I met with Scout before I met here. I'm trying, I'm trying to explain the process. But um, so if, if City Council um, has a series of um, committees that make recommendations on various items, parks, rec, so on and so forth, um, the Planning Zoning Commission serves as a recommendation to Council. 
all decisions go to council. So when you hear them one way or another, they, they are simply making a recommendation to city council. So per the planning and zoning code, which is the viable one that we must follow, within 30 days from tonight's public hearing, the planning and zoning commission has to they, they must take they have to do one of three options. They can vote to adopt the motion recommending the initiation of the SPD to City Council. They can vote to continue the review of the SPD, and they can vote not to recommend the initiation of the SPD. Once they make that recommendation, one way or another, which can be up to 30 days from tonight, then we have 30 days to take that recommendation to City Council, and then the next steps, the next steps in the process begins. Before I'm done, Mark, I didn't know maybe you guys are very good with how we explain the process and sort of what we're about to do. Yeah, I think, um, just to be clear, we're not evaluating the, um, the zoning or the, I should say, the, the, some of the specifics that are indicated that we've been given a concept plan and some other information. We're not evaluating the detail of that plan. We're just recommending or, or quoting what we recommend on the table or not recommended to Central Council. And if it were to pass through Council, <coughs> it would come back to this body for all the detail. Yeah, this through the process. And, and also for all the transparency, when the city receives emails regarding projects from people, EVA, for instance, stamps receive date, and we allow City Council access to those. So if they have papers, and that's what these are, and these are certainly public records. So um, that's what these are for, that's traditional what he does. So, I think that's all I have on. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to have the uh, developer come up and address the group, and after that, we will open it up for the uh, speak as well. So please uh, mention your, state your name, address, and the rest of the um, First of all, thanks everyone for your time tonight. My name is Matt Mains. Um, with the Trees Company, 211 Grand View Drive. Uh, I do have several of my team members here. Uh, Rick Pedro, our attorney, Jamal Adami, he's the um, traffic engineer who performed the study. Uh, Jim Watson, our civil engineer, is somewhere around here. And once I'm finished, if there's some more details, they might be able to help out with some of those as well. So, um, over the past year, we've had a chance to kind of show this to several different groups. Uh, I know we reached out to all the neighbors that were notified for this once and uh, showed them a presentation. Uh, we reached out to White Pillars and worked with their HOA a couple times to set up a couple virtual meetings to show them the presentation and uh, really get some feedback, make a few tweaks, uh, and, you know, make sure everyone understood what we were looking at. Uh, so now that it's annexed in, we're excited to formally introduce Harvest, a master plan community developed by trees. So most of you here are familiar with trees. Uh, we are headquartered just across the river in North Kentucky. We're a family owned and operated business. And um, what a lot of people aren't aware is we do operate quite a few places in the country, 10 major metropolitan areas, spanning from Cleveland down to Dallas. Uh, we're proud of a lot of the awards we've received. Um, including uh, America's Best Builder for Builder Magazine, National Builder of the Year from Professional Builder Magazine, and uh, we're currently ranked as one of the top 20 private builders in the nation, and uh, we, we have a long history in Welton. Uh, this is one of our upcoming projects in Welton area. This is a model home that we're going to be featuring in the uh, upcoming home around the Chimney Bridge, and uh, just wanted to show, sort of show that off a little bit. So uh, before jumping into the plan, I think it's important that we review the zone and understand how this fits into the context of the community. Um, again, as he mentioned, as Mr. Uh, as he mentioned, once everything's brought into the city, it's brought in as residential land development until further zoning is brought before and can be reestablished or the chiefs not. Uh, with this, at 1.92 acres, 1.92 units per acre. It really fits into sort of the low end of that residential medium development uh, category. If you look at what's around this property, it's almost entirely surrounded by residential medium density. So it really fits into that context of what the zoning is. Uh, we're requesting an SPD. If you compare it to the adjacent SPD, White Pillars, uh, they're actually a little denser at 2.3 to 2.4 units per acre. So that's sort of um, a good comparison. 
of what we're looking at. So then why an SPD versus a residential medium development center? Uh, simply put, it's flexibility. Um, it, it provides us the ability to show, to offer a variety of sought after homes, um, ranging everywhere from 92 foot wide lots to more compact patio homes. The lot sizes that we're seeing are appropriate for what we see as the market demand. This is the lot sizes that our customers are asking us to provide. Uh, the flexibility allows us to better use the land. It allows us to avoid some of those naturally sensitive areas, places like the ponds, some of the streams that run through the site, some of the steeper hillsides that are heavily wooded. The reduced setbacks, they sort of pull everything closer to the roads, make it a little more efficient, allow us to kind of cluster those homes together. So it makes for a lot more efficient grading and drainage plan. So a smaller design print footprint overall and less of an impact on the land. And probably most importantly, uh, an SPD is a different concept than traditional zoning. It trades some of that individual ownership, the large one acre lots that are fenced in, that's that person's property. It trades that for community open space. So in this, in this uh, proposal we're putting forward, we're offering uh, this community is going to have 37 acres of open space for almost 34% of the site that's HOA owned and maintained. So that really leads us into the vision of what we have for this development. Um, the Grail organization has explored various options for this property, along with the property next door to it that was eventually sold to the Claremont County Parks. That's 100 acres as well. So between them, there's about 200 plus acres just there. So um, like I said, they eventually sold that off to Claremont County Parks. And now they performed a lengthy search to try to find a developer that really shared their vision. After responding to a request for a proposal and going through an extensive interview process, uh, we were honored to be chosen as the builder that they chose to, um, to, uh, to sell this land to. Uh, we understand that the land has a lot of history, as is evidenced by the support and the people that are here tonight. Uh, so we wanted to really create a community that honors that history, that shares the vision of not only the Grail, but of um, everyone else around and connects residents with each, with each other and connects them with the nature in and around the site. So we put a lot of focus on the open spaces, we put a lot of focus on the trails and amenities to really create a balance between the neighborhoods and the environment surrounding them. So um, with that being said, I think we can sort of start digging into the plan. The site's really organized, sort of a central spine down the center that, as mentioned, has entrances on a abandoned bill in Oakland Road. Um, it's important to note that all the necessary infrastructure uh, is available to, in, adjacent to the site. So Dries is going to be responsible for all the improvements, including roads, underground utilities, grading. It's all um, found that all the infrastructure is adequate and uh, regularly available for us to tie into. Um, with this plan, again, we wanted to create spaces for exploration, places to get out into the environment. Uh, we wanted to find places where residents could gather uh, meet up with each other. We wanted to identify where it's suitable for development and vice versa, find areas that weren't suitable for development and make sure those are protected. And then finally, we want to offer convenient access to all these communal open spaces, the gardens, the trails, and the amenities that we're providing. One of the biggest uh, selling points of this property is the uh, park that's going to be adjacent to it. So um, we've been working closely with Claremont County Parks and we're providing, we're working jointly to provide a connection to that park. So they would come in off of our entrance off of Oakland Road. Uh, I think after going back and forth, it's really difficult for them to access their park from their site, which is right on that bend because of the site distance and some of the issues. So um, again, talking with Claremont County Park, they offered to allow us and they wanted us to kind of share a little more information. And so with the background of these both being part of the rail property, I thought it was important that we kind of go into that a little bit as well. And they wanted us to kind of review some of that information. So um, the park was a, about 100 acres that was purchased using Clean Ohio funds. Uh, the front or the south portion of it right along 48 is the front 
eight or ten acres is to have planned for some restroom and shelters, trailheads. The rest of it is primarily going to be natural areas that they plan on removing invasive species, um, restoring it to a more natural habitat. And one of the things we're working jointly also with them is to install an overlook that sits at one of the higher points of the park and it's sort of right on that corner that's right above the harvest, 109 acres. That's where we plan on having an overlook. These are just some conceptual images about what they wanted to share. Things like observation decks, natural play areas. Um, they wanted to have electric Wi-Fi, <coughs> those type of amenities there. So um, part of their literature, they said the railroad park was designed for a place for families and friends to escape the wilderness only steps away from their front door. So um, the partnership with trees, uh, I think it's going to help provide them a few things. One is the safe entrance from State Route 48, a pedestrian connection to State Route 48. Uh, if you look at our entrance along Oakland Road in this park, it's about 1.3 miles from downtown. So it's a, a reasonable walk and certainly a very easy bike ride to downtown. To the through the park. And so um, along with that, uh, the stub stream coming into it will bring convenient access to some of the infrastructure so they'll be able to tie into the water, tie into the sewer, some of those items, and also, like I mentioned, the overlook. So this is what we envision for the overlook. Again, it sits sort of at a higher point in that corner. It really overlooks that valley. So what we're planning on is a sort of a circular stone seating area, high point, uh, trellis, and um, again, we're working going to the width of Claremont County Parks make sure that it's something, once we build it, they're going to maintain and uh, keep up with. So from there, I think we can transition into some of the more uh, the amenities that we're providing internally to the community. Uh, the conservation and stewardship of the land was an important piece of the vision that we had at Harvest. So we can accomplish this, I think, in a few ways. Um, one, rather than having large swaths of manicured, heavily irrigated ponds, Kind of feature a lot more open spaces, seated natural grasses and wildflowers. We plan to include wild uh, and include pollinator plots. And essential to the site is uh, we're featuring community gardens. Uh, the community gardens are really just a place where people can come together, share in activities that sort of promotes this idea of stewardship. Um, it's a place where families can gather, grow vegetables, and uh, kind of share in that activity. Um, in addition to the standard sidewalks along the streets, um, scattered around the site and highlighted here in yellow, we've uh, designed nature trails in and around us sort of pull the residents off of those streets and into the open spaces. The trails are going to serve as convenient arteries that will uh, access the open spaces, allow people to get over to the park, connect several places into the park area, and just sort of connect everyone and bring them into some of those amenity areas. Scattered around the community, uh, we plan on um, designing several pocket bars. Uh, we have a goal that every home is going to be within a short, probably about 500 foot wall of one of these parking pocket bars. And so it's simply a place, maybe just a bench and a garden, just a place where people can relax and enjoy the scenery. As Mr. Kennedy mentioned, there's a couple ponds that are existing on site. Uh, these are two uh, existing natural features that we really want to highlight and enhance. So by cleaning up around them, we can open up views to the ponds, give people access to them, uh, kind of pull people in, and the ponds kind of create the two ends of this natural greenway that's going to be run sort of throughout the neighborhood. At each entrance, we uh, wanted to create an inviting front door to the neighborhood. So we're still working on the non invitation It's going to come down the road, but uh, really it's going to be sort of similar size and scope of other uh, entry monuments that we've built around here. And finally, uh, the farmhouse style community center is really going to be a hub of this central amenity area that's sort of at the center of the site. So it's really the, the farmhouse style is meant to sort of evoke the neighborhood's history. Uh, the central amenity area will have a pool. Um, it's still sort of being determined what all other amenities it will have, but uh, it will include items, things like fire pits, manicured lawns for guard, or manicured lawns for gathering, and uh, outdoor seating areas. 
So uh, shifting gears a little bit, we can start talking about some of the architecture that's being proposed. Um, we really organize the community in three different home styles kind of based on lot size. The first is the patio homes that are highlighted in blue that are central to the site and uh, flanking the amenity center there. So the next step up in the lot size is 62 foot wide lots. These are what we're calling traditions and they're located in the northwest and southeast section highlighted in red. And finally, the larger heritage homes are located along that central road. The legacy of our patio homes uh, will be on 52 foot wide minimum lots. Uh, they're going to range in size from about 1,775 square feet to about 2,300 square feet. Um, all of our patio homes include lawn maintenance and snow pushing as part of the HOA. So, um, all owners of patio homes can be assured that their yards are professionally maintained. And really, this floor plan and these style of lots are catering towards buyers that are generally looking to downsize but upgrade and finishes and features. It's usually somebody who's looking for less maintenance. And so, for that reason, this buyer is almost entirely empty nesters, is what we're seeing. Okay, the next step up the traditional slots, they're sitting on 62 foot wide lots. They range in size from 1,876 square feet to about 3,300 square feet. These tend to be more family, more families and move up buyers. And finally, the heritage homes that are sitting on 92 foot wide lots, their footprints will range, or their square footage will range in size from about 2,270 2, square feet to about 3,300 square feet. These uh, larger lots are generally attracting people that are looking for third car garages, side entry garages. Um, all the homes within Harvest are going to consist almost predominantly of masonry front facades, so brick, stone, hardy board, high grade finishes. Um, you know, although we're a larger builder, Trees uh, makes is very proud of the customization that we allow with our homes. For this reason, we allow our customers to choose a lot of finishes and features to make their homes unique and make their communities unique. So at this time, we're anticipating home prices to be in that range of about $450,000 to pushing well over $700,000, depending on kind of features and what the options are that are chosen. This is just a little bit of a matrix to, uh, that breaks down uh, how many homes in each style, so 74 legacy homes, 84 traditions, 51 heritage homes. Uh, it also gives the setbacks that we're proposing. proposing. Um, again, like any municipality, we understand school capacity is concern. Um, one thing to note is that, again, with 74 of those 35 percent of the homes are big patio homes, they're likely not to add any, um, any kids into the school system. And with the other homes, we're phasing this in over four, five, six, seven years. So it's really, um, a phased approach that, that should be time to hopefully adjust and uh, understand the impact that the, uh, the house will have. <clears throat> Again, this is how the acres breaks down. So it's about 109 acres, so that's where we get to 1.92 units per acre. And again, 37%, 37 acres of open space and about 34% of the same. Again, traffic is a, um, we want to take a step back and understand that Dublin is an exciting downtown. As is, again, as we can see tonight, we understand that the success of Dublin and the attraction of Dublin brings with it traffic. So uh, we understand that. So we want to take the initiative to engage a traffic engineer with SHA engineering. Um, so the purpose of this study was to generate a traffic impact study to, uh, to measure what the impact is this development is going to have on the traffic. So uh, it was roughly about a year ago now that traffic counts were collected at peak hours. They estimated the number of trips generated by this new community. They use an the international traffic um, engineer's trip generation manual. Um, to do that, it's a sort of the industry standard. And then this is forecasted out for 10 years with a gross factor put on top of it. So we really looked at four intersections and what we're trying to understand is what's the impact, how long the wait is going to increase in there. So um, 
uh, intersections one and two, one downtown and the one at uh, Welcome Miami Hill Road and Oakland Road, were both, they're both existing signals and they're signalizing some intersections. So what was found is with the new, with this traffic, it really doesn't have any significant impact. <laughs> the new entrances at Oakland and Abandonville Road, uh, what we're looking for there is mainly our domain is going to be needed to prevent traffic from backing up as you're coming in and out of the community. So there was uh, no east, no turn lane. It was found that no turn lane was warranted at the abandoned bill, but at the eastbound, an eastbound turn lane would be warranted at the Oakland Road, uh, and Drees again would be uh, responsible for constructing that turn lane. And it's worth noting that again, that is the proposed entrance to the park as well. So uh, just circling back to the overall plan, um, we're extremely excited about parks and the features that it provides the community. Our goal is to create a signature community, signature neighborhood that's going to become an integral part of Loveland. We believe that this plan is respectful to the environment. It maximizes the benefits of the area. We want a community that not only attracts residents to the city, but also provides homes to existing residents, new, new homes to existing residents that may be looking to build and stay within the city. So, um, and finally, with the adjacent parks, the ample open space that we're providing and the amenities, uh, we believe that we're holding true to the vision of uh, giving the families a place that they can connect with each other and connect with nature. And for those reasons, we uh, respectfully request that you approve the SPD. So, thank you. Um, again, me and my team are available to speak. Thank you. Good evening, members of the commission and residents. Um, as Matt had indicated, I'm Rick Ayla, the attorney for um, Drees, um, located here off prison in downtown Cincinnati at 425 Walnut. Um, all of you have a lot of experience in hearing these types of developments. I'm not going to go into a great amount of detail. Matt has done that very, very well. And ask for your consideration on the review process. As all of you know that the primary concerns, especially when it comes down to Loveland, is traffic, 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 um, as well as schools. You also get into, is it how is this going to affect my property values and how is this going to affect my quality of life? Um, one of the things that I, I, I do want to remind the board that your decision-making process is a code-based process. That um, aside from emotions, aside from um, the, the crowd here it has to be based on facts. The, the underlying facts are, as presented by trees, including traffic, as indicated by um, the traffic study, there is little impact to the existing traffic. To that, which I suspect there is not here today, that cannot be considered in your decision-making process. Let me, uh, the, the same goes for um, how does this want to affect my property values. Well, from a basis of um, 450,000 to up to 800 or more, again, unless there is quantified, quantified data to refute that this will not affect someone's property value, Again, not for your consideration. It's what's in the best interest of the health, safety, welfare of the community in the totality of the circumstances in reviewing this process for SPD. Let's talk about schools just for a second. As Matt had indicated that this is a phased development. So of the 200 odd units that are being proposed, you take out of that equation 74 units. On a phase development anywhere from four to seven years, the impact on the schools will be, if anything, negligible. You have a significant amount of additional tax base that will go directly to the schools. The 74 units themselves, and all of you using your own common sense, all of that tax base will go to the schools to support the schools with virtually no impact. 
So you have 175, 180 gap units that the schools may be impacted by. And so collectively, the total income tax revenue, exclusive of, or including the 74 units, will go to support the schools, especially over a phase development. Again, regardless of what the emotions may turn out to be, there has to be data, not conjecture, not assumptions, in front of you tonight to make your decision based upon what the code requires you to make, not based upon what someone may feel, someone may think. And I come down to love them all the time. We all do. It's a wonderful community. Traffic today was horrible. I hope I parked in the legal parking space. I'm not sure that I did. Um, but again, based on the traffic study, which our traffic engineer can testify to, um, the, the impact, especially on downtown, is not going to be that great. And any required improvements based upon that traffic impact study in conjunction with the traffic engineer will be made. So uh, also one, one final note is if you look around this site, the site plan, you can see a few homes, what I, I would say a handful of homes, that are directly adjacent to the east primarily, some to the south. Um, you know, outside of the Columbus, or St. Columbus school area, but most of those homes are to the east. And you can, and you can see there are significant screenings. There are huge amount of open space. And what Matt had indicated, the Grail property, the, the owners of the Grail, when they came to Dreams, that this development had to be in conjunction with the 100 acres that would be sold to the parks. So of the 200 odd acres that the Grail has owned, about 160 acres of that will be set aside for continuing over open space. So those directly affected to the east, you know, with the, the natural screening, additional screening, the setbacks from the homes, um, and consistent with current zoning of media density, the impact on them will be negligible. So I, I simply ask in closing that you base your decision upon the facts not upon the emotion of what's in front of you today, and based upon the code and the analysis you will get for what we have presented today um, in making your decision. Thank you.